Hello booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Book as in Books. In today's video, I want to talk about short books uh, because there's a lot of joy in reading short books and I've read a few lately. Uh, when, If you've seen my video, my book haul of when I went to Stratford or Toronto, well, I went to Stratford and I stopped by Toronto. I bought a bunch of short books and I've read a few of them. So I want to talk about them. So these are the books that I read basically in between booktube prize books, which were a bit heftier. So, uh, the first book, um, well, it's not the first one that I read, but it happens to be at the top of the pile uh, because it's the smallest in format. <laughs> it is The Uncommon Reader by Alan Bennett. And if you're new to my channel, I keep the price tags on my books because I think it's relevant information. Relevant and mainly interesting. I think it's fun to know how much I paid for a book. Um, so, this is the absolutely lovely, delightful story of Queen Elizabeth II, who is falling in love with Reed Day. If you know just a little bit about Queen Elizabeth II, you will not necessarily associate her with an, with an intellectual. Um, she's not somebody who reads a lot. Uh, I should talk in the past, she's deceased now. Uh, she was not somebody who read a lot. And the situation in this book is that um, she sort of feels herself compelled to read a book. She doesn't really want to, but she has to, and she's a woman of her who, who does her duty. She feels she has to read a book by circumstances that in real life would never happen. And she reads the book, and it, it's just fine. And then she sort of kind of feels compelled to read another one, and that one she loves. And then she finds another one, another one, another one, and she just falls in love with reading. And this is what would have happened had our queen been a voracious reader. Um, and it, this book is about the joy of reading. It's not about the queen. It's not about books. It's about the joy of reading. And it's just, it's so much fun. <laughs> I recommend it. It's just delightful. If you need something, a little pick me up. It, this is going to pick you up. It's just, it's just so much fun. And there are corgis in there too, so it's fun. <laughs> uh, next, we have something very different in tone. This is Mad Shadows by Marie Claire Blais. So this is the first time, I think, that I read in English a book that was originally written in French. And the reason I chose that book is that it was uh, in a bag of uh, mystery books, a mystery bag of books. I bought 10 books for $10 without knowing what they were, and this was in the pile. And I'm very happy I read this. It's a very good book. It's a debut novel of this author, Marie-Claire Blais. Uh, she died, um, I think it was last year, or perhaps, yeah, I think it was last year, in the fall of 2022. And I've never read any of her books. And she is uh, one of the great writers of Quebec, of French Canada. And I knew that she was a worthy read, but for some reason I had never read her. And now I have, I've read this one. Um, the title in French is La Belle Bête. So if we translate that word for word, it would be The Beautiful Beast. And that is the nickname of the youngest child in this book. So uh, the story is that of a mother, a single mother and her two children. Um, at the beginning of the book, uh, the, the two children are rather young. Uh, the, the youngest one is like 10 years old, I think, and the oldest one is a teenager, uh, 13, 14. Uh, but then it, it doesn't stay like that very long. Very quickly they grew up and um, they become teenagers, but in the late teens. And the situation in this family, the dynamic is that the mother is, is has money, but she's very vapid, very superficial. And the importance, what is important to her is to have money, is to have beautiful things. And it's all in the appearance. She's sort of a beauty queen. And for her, beauty is very important. The daughter is not beautiful. The daughter is ugly. And the mother does not love her daughter. And the boy is extremely beautiful. And the mother is in complete admiration of her son. He's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to her because he is so beautiful. And because he is so cuddled, always treated like a baby, he sort of remains a baby in a way. And he's an idiot. And the daughter who is intelligent resents all this attention that her brother has. And she resents this, um, the fact that she is discarded by because she's not beautiful. Um, and beautiful beast, um, th there's a double meaning in beast. Uh, in French, it also means stupid. So it means beast like a, an animal, but it also means stupid. And that describes very much the personality or the, uh, not so much the personality, but the, um, yeah, the, 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 the personality, the, the character of the youngest character. Um, so uh, this is a novel that is set somewhat it's in the countryside, unidentified countryside. 
the family lives in isolation of pretty much everything and they they are there's so much tension it's very dark even though there are descriptions of bright sunshines and the light on on the uh, on the land on the lake and all of that it's it's a dark book <laughs> it's a dark book bad things happen in this um yeah if you like books that are somewhat a bit it's a bit weird in a way because this this relationship between mother and children it's not it's not natural it's not something you'd see in real life uh but it's 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 very good anyway uh i i don't i don't think i'm doing credit to that book but it's very good i recommend it um and yeah the, the, the thing is i read this in english um i did not feel anything particularly french canadian about the book so i don't know if it's because it was not in the original or if it's because it was lost in translation um i haven't read the original so i don't know but i suppose that one day i will read the original because i think it would be worth it so i want to read more of, by this author by Marie claire Blais. um this is her debut and it's a very good debut um and it's uh yeah it's it, it's it's weird uh but it's good it's good next is uh a, a bit less good though the author is much more famous aging and abetting by muriel spark the, the the I have to use the F word for that book, and that particular F word <laughs> is forgettable. Um, because I had to read the back of the book to sort of remind myself what it was about. And I read this less than a month ago, and I already forgot. Wh what is this about again? And it's about a therapist who uh, receives a call and um, from a prospective client who claims to be Lord Lucan. And Lord Lucan has been missing for decades because he murdered his wife. His wife and children, just his wife. Anyway, um, no, uh, he killed the children's nanny and botched the killing of his wife. So anyway, he's wanted for murder and has been wanted for murder for decades. But because he's a lord, he receives the help of his friends who, who are the lords who don't think he's a bad guy. Yeah, he killed someone, but he's not a bad guy, you know. But the thing is that this therapist, who could in theory call the police and say, hey, I have Lord Lucan with me, already has another patient who claims to be Lord Lucan. So this is a game of identity of who's whom, of uh, doubles, of secret lives and all of that. And while reading it, it was very enjoyable. It was a lot of fun to read it. But as I said a month later, I forgot what it was about. And yeah, it's it's good, but it's not memorable. It's it, it's serviceable. You'll have a good time, but nothing else. It's it's unlikely to to bowl you over. So it's uh, it's that. The next one. The next one. I think. I th is it my favorite of the all the books? I think it's a, it's it's hard to compare because some books are so different from the others. But this this is a very very good one. Not Russian by Mikhail Shilev, Shivelev, and it is translated from Russian by Brian James Bear and Ellen Vayner, and it is at Europa Editions. I've heard a lot of people talk about Europa Editions, and I've never paid attention before, but I think I'm going to pay attention now because this was good. So this is set in Russia, in contemporary Russia um, of the mid 2010s. Um, it, it's not written. The, the copyright says 2022 for uh, the translation, but it doesn't talk about the original. So I don't know when the original was published. I think it was 2016. So it's it's quite recent. And the situation is that there is a hostage. There's a hostage crisis. Somebody took people hostage in a church outside of Moscow in a suburb. And the hostage taker requests the presence of our narrator, who is a journalist. And the narrator is a bit puzzled, saying, well, I'm not a hostage negotiator. And no, he, he was asked for because he knows him. He knows the hostage taker personally. Um, so the hostage taker's name is Vadik, uh, which is short for uh, Vladimir, I think. Um, and um, he... He is our main character in, in a way. Uh, even though it's told from the point of view of the journalist, it's very much about Vedic and his life. And the way the journalist and Vedic met was that in the 1990s, the journalist went to uh, report on the situation in Chechnya. Officially, there was no war in Chechnya. And however, there were prisoners of wars. There were um, a few prisoners of war and the journalist somehow played a role in having them freed. And one of them was Vedic. And we sort of learn about Vedic's life through the book. There are a lot of flashbacks, the present, the past, the present, the past. And in the past, there are multiple pasts. So it's a multiple timeline kind of book. So if you don't like that, this is not going to be uh, to your taste. But um, what 
I loved about this book is, is that it, it reminded me of how chaotic the 1990s were in Russia. Um, so if you were not old enough to be aware of the situation in the 1990s in Russia, I don't know how much this book will speak to you. Um, but it, it's something important to know, I think, to understand the situation in Russia today is how chaotic the 1990s were. It was, Russia was a collapsed state, was a failed state, almost as much as Libya today or Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein. Or it, it, there's a vacuum created when a dictatorship falls and the communist system was very much a dictatorship. So when the system fell, it was replaced by officially by democracy, but basically by nothing. Um, so the police were corrupt, the officials were corrupt. Uh, there was inflation like mad. So if you were retired and you had to live on a pension, your pension could not even buy you food for a week. Um, and I'm not even talking about transportation, which used to be free and now you had to pay for uh, lodging and anything else. So it was utter chaos. And that book reminded me of those years that not that I lived them personally, but I knew someone who lived them personally and through newspapers. And I, I, I sort of knew in a way how chaotic it was, but I had forgotten about that because that's what Vladimir Putin did is that he created something else and people just forgot about the 1990s. But I think it helps to explain a lot why the people in Russia today don't mind Vladimir Putin because the only experience they had of democracy was the 1990s, which was chaos. It was hell. Um, it was a very disagreeable time. And I don't blame people for saying Putin saved us because in a way he did. So in a way, I can sort of understand the admiration that a lot of people have for Putin in Russia. Um, I can understand why they think a dictatorship is preferable to democracy because the experience that they had, it, it's kind of true. The, um, the dictatorship is preferable to the, the democracy that they had. It was not a good democracy. So uh, I kind of understand that you to, to, ha to live your day-to-day -day life living under Putin is not that bad compared to what it was to living under democracy in the 1990s. Uh, free speech is overrated, basically, um, <laughs> says the person who has a YouTube channel who, who, who talks bad things sometimes about books and who says anything that he wants without any fear of repercussions. Uh, anyway, so um, and now I've been talking about myself as a third person. Oh, God, grief. Okay, this video should end. <laughs> Um, so anyway, this book reminded me of the chaotic 1990s and it also puts a lot of perspective on the uh, hostage taker because a hostage taker, it's a bad person and you, um, you sort of see his point of view. And there's something that happens to this hostage taker, that to this Vedic, there's some things that happen to him and it, it's about, uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but it, it has to do with... Uh, Something that happened with the authorities and yeah, you end up having a lot of sympathy for the hostage taker and you're not supposed to because he's a hostage taker. He's a bad person. He threatens to kill innocent people. Anyway, anyway, so th this puts a lot of things in perspective. It sort of shows that uh, situations are not black and white. And anyway, I really, really love that book. So if you like any book that has like, kind of a little bit of a political tangent to it, um, it's, it's very good. And finally, uh, finally, it's three books. It is uh, this trilogy by Elie Wiesel. So this is Night, then this is Dawn, and then Day. So that's the order in which they were published, the order, the chronological order of the action in the books. Uh, however, it is a trilogy only in name, I think, much more than in content. There is a thread linking the books, uh, because in all three situations, the main character, I'm going to say character, even though the first one is a memoir and the other two are novels, uh, but the main character in each book is a survivor of the Holocaust. Uh, but beyond that, th there's nothing to really link the books. So the first one is the the essential one. Uh, it's night. It's a memoir of Elie Wiesel going through the Holocaust. As any Holocaust memoir, it is extremely moving. It is, um, it's very sad. Um, it's not an easy read, but in a way, it's very good for you. Um, it's, it's sort of food for the soul in a way. Even, you read horrible stuff in there, but it's good for you. Um, so, um, and it's very interesting too, that it's well written and there's, it's, 
like, like pretty much any book about the Holocaust is who lives and who dies. You want to know at the end who who survives. So does he ever meet his family again? Um, and anyway. So uh, the situation is that Elie Wiesel grew up in a small town, a small Jewish town, mainly in um, what was then Hungary. Uh, today, I don't know where it is. It was in Transylvania, and that's a region that sort of changed place uh, several times in the first half of the 20th century. So now, uh, today, I don't know where it is anymore. So I don't know if that small town is still Hungary or if it's in Romania or some other country. Uh, but at the time, it was in Hungary, and the Jews of Hungary were rather protected. So until 1944, the Jews of Hungary basically had nothing to suffer, uh, even though their country, in theory, was allied with the Germans. Well, not in theory. They, the country was allied with Germany. But a bit like in Italy, um, the Jews didn't really have to suffer until the Germans took over. And the same thing happened in 1944. Basically, the Germans more or less took over and suddenly um, they had to deal not with the uh, Hungarian army, but with the SS. And so in the span of a very few weeks, um, as opposed to other countries where it took months or years, in a very few weeks, the Jews suddenly had to wear the yellow star, then they had to move in the ghetto, and then the ghettos were emptied. Um, and it happened very quickly, and that did not give them a lot of time to react. But for a long time, the Jews of Hungary thought, well, it's not going to happen to us, we're safe. It's not going to happen to us, we're safe. And um, except all the ore of the wars, which are, of course, the, the important thing of the book, what I realized reading this book for, for a second time, because I read this book when I was much younger and I read it in French, but I, I cannot say I really remembered that much about it, because at some point uh, when you read many Holocaust memoirs, they sort of blend into one another because the horror of Auschwitz is the horror of Auschwitz. Um, um, and I anyway, um, what what struck me this time around when reading this book is how impossible it is to make a smart decision when you don't have the information. So um, at the beginning, when they are living freely and in theory, they could leave. Um, they don't because they think it's not going to happen to us. We're fine. We're fine. We, it's in Hungary that we are the best protected because some of them, some of them, some Jews had fled from, let's say, Poland to France and then France got occupied and they, 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 they were sent, the, the, the refugees were sent to concentration camps anyway. So they had reasons to believe that they were the safest in Hungary. Uh, and then when it started being not true, uh, there was a former maid of the Diesel family who offered them shelter in the countryside. I'll hide you. Come, come, come to my place. I'll hide you. You'll be safe and people won't talk. And they decide to turn the offer down because in the ghetto, it's not that bad. They, they, they are still within their homes because their home was in the, um, in the ghetto. Uh, they have family members living with them. So they're not living with strangers. And it, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And then, of course, they are transported to Auschwitz. Um, and then in Auschwitz, they make one smart decision because they are lucky in a way. A prisoner tells them to lie about their age, uh, to, tells that to Elie Wiesel and his father. So Elie Wiesel ages himself, he tells he's 18, and the father um, youngers himself, <laughs> makes himself younger and says he's just 45 and not 50 something. So um, they, they survived this election. So that was a smart decision, but only because somebody gave them the information. Had no one told them that, they w probably would have answered honestly and both of them would have been sent to the, to the gas chambers in all likelihood. But then again, we don't know. We can only know what happened. We don't know what could have happened. And so on and so forth like that. They have to make decisions and very often they don't have the right information. And what I was thinking was, if you knew who would live and die, at the end, um, because Elif, Elie Wiesel's father does not make it. Um, he dies on the death march. And there was a, a point earlier in the book when Elie Wiesel saves his father from beatings by giving away a gold tooth. And he says that he gave his gold tooth for nothing because the person to whom he gave it, so the, the capo who took it, was removed two weeks later. So he said, well, I gave it for nothing. And then I was sort of thinking, well, if you knew her father would die at the end, would, would you have kept it? The for nothing, was it the two weeks or was it the three, the, 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 the full year that followed? Um, so anyway, it's impossible to make smart decisions in these uh, situations. And the other decision that they could not make was at the very end. Um, they could hear the bombardment. They could hear the, the Soviet army reaching the, 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 um, the region where they were. And the Germans decided to evacuate the camp. At that time, Elie Wiesel was in the hospital of Auschwitz because he had a problem with his foot. 
and um, the Germans said the people in the hospital can stay, they don't have to leave. And um, because uh, Wiesel was friendly with the doctor, they could have had his father admitted to the hospital too. So they thought, do we stay? But then the, the knowledge that they had was that since when had the Germans ever allowed a weak Jew to live, uh, a useless Jew to live? So they figured either when they leave, they're going to burn the camp with the people in it. Uh, either it is uh, there are mines underneath, they're just going to bomb everything, it's going to explode. Either they poison the food or th there's something that's going to happen. The people left behind are going to die. The only ones who have a chance to survive are those who are strong enough to survive. So they decided to leave the camp and go on what would be called the death march uh, because they march at very high speed in the middle of winter with no food, no water, um, all the way from Auschwitz to Buchenwald. And... Um, yeah, they, 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 that's the decision that they made, Ellie and his father, because they thought that's the smart thing to do. Um, but it turns out that what happened to the people who were left behind was that two days later, the Red Army liberated them. So their, their, their hell was over in two days later, um, as opposed to uh, Elie Wiesel and his father, who would um, wh wh whose hell would continue. Um, in the case of Elie Wiesel's father, uh, it lasted just for the death march because he died at the end of that death march. Um, Elie Wiesel stayed in the camp uh, until it was liberated by the Americans in early April, early April, end of April, in April. Uh, so he had to live through another three months of uh, concentration camp. So it's impossible to make a smart decision when you don't have the information. It's impossible to, to control your future, basically. Um, and even more in situation like this, when you have already extremely little control on your own life, it's it, most of it depends on other people. So how, how many smart decisions can you really take? So that, that was the thing that struck me on this reading of this book. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you really should read this book. It's very good. And it's, as I said, it's good for your soul. Um, the other two. The other two are novels, so they are not on the same level of you must read. Uh, but they are interesting too. So Dawn, of the three books, I think this one I liked the least. Uh, the, the least. Um, so this one is very short, it's 80 pages, and it's set in uh, what is going to be, uh, in, in what is today Israel. Um, at the time the book is set, it is in uh, Palestine under British protectorate. And uh, the main character in this book, he is a survivor of the Holocaust, but it doesn't seem to play a major role. The only reason it plays a role is that uh, because of that, he was recruited into an organization that is fighting for uh, the creation of Israel. So the liberation of Palestine to create a Jewish state in Palestine. Um, and this organization, from the point of view of the authorities, from probably the point of view that we would have today, is a terrorist organization. And one thing that they do is that they take a hostage, a British officer. Um, and the point of view of the movement is that they are at war with the UK because uh, they want, they, they attack only officers, not just officers, they attack only soldiers. So they attack only the army, only the bases, uh, the British bases. They have no interest in uh, destructing uh, anything in civilian life. Uh, they, they don't want to attack the population. They don't want to destroy things that are useful to the civilian population. They just want to attack the British domination. So in their mind, they are at war. And hostages being taken, taken, and our main character is tasked with killing him. So he knows that at dawn, he's going to have to kill someone. And that is the story of this book. It is the dilemma in this book. Um, somebody who knows what it is to be... To, to see, who has seen a lot of people die, will now become the person who's going to inflict that. Um, so, well, he's being asked to do that. Of course, we don't know if he's really going to do that because he has, um, he, he can decide to do it or not, I guess. Anyway, so this is the, 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 um, the question at the heart of this book, which is interesting, but only somewhat. <laughs> um, and then there's this one, which I think is more interesting. This is Day, and this is set in New York City. So again, our main character is a survivor of the Holocaust, uh, but this character has lost the will to live, basically. He goes through the motions, but he's not feeling anything. In a way, he's already dead. And he has a car accident. Well, not a car accident. He is hit by a taxi. He's a pedestrian. He's walking, and he's hit by a taxi. 
and um, it's it's bad. It's a very it's very bad. He is rushed to the hospital, and there's a young doctor there who does everything to save him, and he does. He saves him, and then the doctor comes and talks to him, and at some point, um, the doctor says, asks basically, why do you not want to live? And it's not because of the conversations that the doctor had with the patient. It's because while he was operating, he realized that this body did not want to live and yeah that that is the question at the center of this book it is can you really leave a concentration camp can you really survive the holocaust um because of course physically you can survive it but mentally can you ever get out of that situation and can can the joy of life ever come back um so that that's a very difficult question at the heart of this book um and it, this one i i preferred this one to the second one so uh, yeah, they. Uh, if you have another translation, it could be the accident. It would be the same book. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention uh, these three books are translated from French. Uh, so in the span of a single month, I read four books that were originally written in French and translated in English. I say originally, but this one, according to the um, to the introduction, uh, it was written in Yiddish. Uh, because Elie Wiesel's first language is Yiddish, and when he grew up in Hungary, he lived in a Yiddish community, and he was educated in Yiddish. And the reason he ended up in France was that at the end of the war, uh, as I said, he was liberated by the uh, American army, and uh, when it came time to relocalize all, all the displaced people, he was asked if he wanted to go back to uh, the place where he came from, and he said no because he basically knew that all his family was dead, that there was nothing to go back to. He said, send me anywhere. And he ended up being sent to France. So that's why he learned French and lived in France. Um, but uh, he wrote it in Yiddish and then I think tried to write it in French and asked the help of someone. So in a way, the French is a translation already. So this is a bit of translation of a translation, but it is translated by the author's wife. So um, the translator knows very well the author, so it, it, it's, it comes very close to an original. So uh, this one is translated by Marion Wiesel. Uh, the other two have two different translators. So when I say this is a trilogy in name only, I think this is another factor, the fact that the three books have different translators. So this one, uh, Dawn, was translated by Francis Frenet, uh, F-R-E-N-A-Y-E. Um, and then uh, this one was translated by, this one being Day, was translated by Anne Borchard. So uh, three books, three translators, uh, three, three different settings, three different main characters. It's a trilogy in name only. Um, so yeah, so that was the last book. So that was the last book I had to talk about. And I guess I'm going to end the video here, which is already long enough. <laughs> so thank you everyone for watching. And uh, let me know in the comments if you've read these books or uh, if you want to read these books. And I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine!